Yeah, just play us in there. Keep playing, man. Just play us in. Do whatever you want. Beat sunny side of the street, bro. Wow, <laughs> that was like something else in this sunny, sunny side. Yeah. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to uh, episode eleven of season two of At Home with Mark. And I got my buddy Eric Finland here. Thanks for uh, for joining us on this episode, Eric. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man. So we're gonna get nerdy about that stuff because, as you know, I play keys as like a second instrument. So it's like my second love. Um, and like gospel piano and all the stuff that you do is like, and you know, Gabe Dixon is all kind of in my like heart. So we'll, we'll get into that nerdy stuff, but dude, thank you again so much for, uh, for doing this. I know you're a new dad. So this is breaking away from the daddiness is a, uh, is a tough thing. So thanks, man. Yeah. So tell me, so when I usually start the show and you've probably seen the beginning of this, but I always like, I'm curious to find out how people get you know started in music. So like I have a very specific moment. I call it the moment mm. that I knew I wanted to, to be involved in music, regardless of whatever it was. Yeah. So is, is there something specific like that for you or has it always just been a thing? Uh, well, my grandmother was a an accompanist, a pianist, and she played for silent films. Um, way back in in the uh early 1900s and she um she had that that ear you know where she she came out of the kind of like the early broadway world where you were you know she, she had the classical chops but she also could play anything by ear so um sh her job for many years was a, a silent film accompanist where she would just see charlie chaplin and and improvise basically in the organ at the top of a the theater right uh in a black curtain so um I, she she kind of bestowed a lot of a lot of music the music starts with kind of her that we as far as we can trace back and uh i started playing since i was three years old piano i i haven't really done anything um <laughs> else I, i've done music my whole life in terms of just things I've, uh, my hobby and my, my, my passion. And, and now, you know, for the last 15 ish years, it's been a profession and, you know, a, a living, a way to make a living. So, um, that's kind of it in a nutshell, but the, the to get to the question, the first kind of bug that kind of bit me with music, I, I mean, I just remember when I was like, what my parents tell me when I was four, that I, I played, like, I sat down and did, right? And, and like, I just plunked it out, not that smoothly, but I plunked it out from, like, hearing my mom play it. And then from there on, I just started getting more into it and classical and then uh, eventually went to Berkeley with you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, didn't we have Livingston Taylor's class together at one point? We did. Right. I don't know. I don't know why we didn't, like, start to hang out then because we both were in the same, like, I feel like we were the oddballs in that class almost. Yeah, we were like the non. Well, you're you're a singer, but I, I it was you can sing. I, I it was like everybody else was like s singers, you know, like right. And so we were the kind of instrumentalists in that class. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, uh, and it went to Berkeley, and then I uh, uh, probably jumping ahead, but I just got my master's at SUNY Purchase. Um, in New York, which is an incredible school in, in jazz performance and um, African American history. Um, and yeah, so it's led me to 
this beautiful basement in the Bronx. <laughs> nice, man. What were some early records? Like, I know that, so you probably studied, like, classically, you know, growing up too. But, like, what were some early records that really got you hooked into music, whether it be pop or whatever? Like, give uh, yeah. me some records early on. Sure. Um, so the, the, the one that really stands out is um, the in crowd, Ramsey Lewis. And um, that whole, just like that whole live sound of, of a trio playing uh, and hearing the, the left hand of Ramsey Lewis, it, it just like baffled me that he, it just sounded so, they were playing, um, you know, like Beatles songs, Hard Day's Night, and, but it was like to a boogaloo, uh, you know, and it was like just the way that his left hand just kind of like comped and, you know, it, it just sounded like another person was there. It mm -hmm. sounded like a, a second pianist was there. So that really uh, just like confused me in, in the best way. Cause I was like, how does his left hand, cause you know, when you come from like a guitar or a saxophone or something, you're playing um, uh, a, a line at a time. It's, it's, it, it's monophonic essentially, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then when you have like, uh, you can play like, well, I guess in guitar you can do that a little bit, but still you have a left hand with piano and you can play like, you know, the comping stuff. And just like even in the tritones that he was doing, just really, um, really, I just, the left hand really spoke to me of just like that support of, you know, it, he wasn't even like burning in the right hand. It was just more. His just left hand was just so funky and so rooted that that's what I latched onto, um, and I've always kind of ha had that mentality of like uh, groove first, mm -hmm. and uh, all this stuff, you know, left right hand stuff second, secondary, mm -hmm. um, and also the dynamics of that record are just so incredible because like in the in crowd, right? Like they bring it down so you can just hear a pin drop. And you can hear the people in the audience, and it's just like when they bring it back up, it's just like electric, and and you feel that, and that is something that I've always tried to incorporate in like a live show, and I always I always have that in the back of my mind. I've never I don't know if I'm familiar with that record. Oh so man, is it an organ trio? No, he he's playing. Uh, it's piano, bass, and drums. Oh and wow! On some of the some of the songs, there's like a horn section. Um, but like the, the, you know, meat and potatoes of it is a piano trio. So it's that like left hand, you know, comping stuff that he's doing that really just, you know, yeah. wowed me. I think the first piano stuff I heard like that earlier on was probably, probably Dave Brubeck <laughs> and, mm -hmm. uh, and like, uh, you know, even, I love Vince Garibaldi, man. Like me too. Oof, some of that stuff is so hip, man. Like, yeah. you know, it, it's just like beyond its years almost in a yeah. way. What yeah. was the first organ like trio record that you heard? Um, organ. Okay. So let me just say one more thing on piano before we yeah. get to organ. And then, cause the, the first solo I ever transcribed on piano was Chuck Lavelle, uh, Jessica. Right. Um, and so that piano solo on Jessica is like the best, like you can sing it, uh, you can sing it back. Right. And it's just, it's so melodic. Um, um, what key it's in like a, I think, right. Yeah. Almond brothers. Right. Right? Yeah. Yeah. A. He does all that like major pentatonic, pentatonic stuff, right? Yeah, and yeah. it's like with a like minor third in there, but it's just like yeah. Right, and all that stuff he's doing is um, is just like it's blues. It's, but it's like that new, 
it was that like new form of blues where there he was getting more like major pentatonic scale uh centric with the music so mm-hmm. it was like uh that really spoke to me and then so so to go from that into Oregon um man I didn't get into Hammond Oregon until uh Berkeley until I took uh Dennis Montgomery's uh gospel organ class and mm-hmm. I really wanted to learn organ and uh because I knew I just I saw I saw a, a, a student that was already at Berkeley he was a f- senior when I was coming in his name was Dane Farnsworth uh, yeah and, I remember that dude yeah it was and I just I saw Dane playing in uh, like one of the rooms and I saw him doing this percussive thing with his hands on the organ and I just like stared watched I just watched him in the window and he was doing like the uh, yeah, he was doing that. Like he was doing that. Like right, that kind of stuff. And I was just like, whoa, because you can't really do that on the piano. You can, but the 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 weight of the keys are so light, so much lighter on the organ. So mm-hmm. in a very like crude way, I just started to like get into the because the practice rooms at Berkeley, you you can get into these beat up Hammond organs that they have in some of the rooms that, you know, are like not really working all the way, but it was enough. And I, I got into them and, um, and then I, it was, I started studying with Bruce Katz, yeah. um, who, uh, was, and is one of the best, uh, like blues pianists that that's living today. And Bruce, uh, got me into organ cause I listened to one of his records, uh, Ronnie Earl live in Europe. Mm-hmm. Oh my God! And That's Ronnie cool. Earl, like, I mean, talk about how how is he for you? I love, yeah. And you know who else was huge into him at Berkeley? I took piano lessons one semester because mm-hmm. I was a songwriting major, so I could I could do like a different instrument. And I yeah. took lessons with Dave Lamina, mm-hmm. and Dave is really into him. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, Dave's in his band. So you're talking about uh, Steve Earl or Ronnie Earl? Ronnie Earl. Yeah, Dave's, yeah, yeah. Dave's yeah, in yeah. his band. Exactly. Yeah. So he introduced me to him. Yes. He also introduced me to a record that I'll never forget the rest of my life that changed my life, the course of my life. Um, when I went in to take my first lesson with him, he put a chart in front of me that said, thank you. And it was Johnny Lang's thank you. Mm-hmm. And man, from then on, he was like, dude, you need to stop playing piano like a guitarist. <laughs> like, Stop it. You're you're starting to play like you're playing like a guitar player would play piano. Like we gotta get oh. you to play like a pianist. Oh interesting. Anyway, I digress. But yeah, so, I yeah. took Dave Lamina too. He was also a huge, huge influence on my playing. Um he's it's like Bruce Cat and and both of them got me really deep in, and steeped into the organ. Um so yeah, I, I, I was that like Ronnie Earl live in Europe. They play um they play Monin and one of the songs and uh you know um like bobby timmons composition and oh man bruce is just destroys on that record uh they all do the whole band um but that that and then dennis montgomery got me into foot pedals and then um i i just remember i was i would my first gig ever at berkeley was at when i was studying at berkeley my freshman year i um i started doing the Dennis's class, and then he he said, "Oh, I got this church for you, man. It's in Roxbury. It's great." And so he like he he like gave me the pastor's information, and they gave me like the address. And I showed I took the bus out there, and it was like I I remember I had an eighty eight weighted keyboard with like the wheels on the back, and I had a I had like a synthesizer in the front, and I was carrying it like one in the front, one in the back, and I was walking to the bus uh to the bus and it was like it was so janky oh man like the connection is right now but it was so it was so janky and um and and it was so heavy and i i went in it was a storefront church which is like there was like three people in the church and um when i got in the church there was a i started playing and the, the pastor just started like going for it and they, he just you know i and, Dennis had taught us to do like talk music, which is like when the, the preacher starts talking, you play music underneath it to accompany him. So yeah, 
you know, when they start revving up and started getting to like the high point of the, um, of the sermon, you have to be ready to like go with them or, or like modulate keys or, or always find like what key they're in and you know, you're accompanying them. Right. Right. Until they get to like song or something. And like, I remember the, there was one woman there she was like 85 and she said, she said, uh, you're, f she just said, you're, one day you're going to be famous like Amos. And, and of course I'm not famous, but very, it just really inspired me to hear that from her. Mm -hmm. And then from, you know, I started going to different churches and then, uh, gospel. Yeah. Like specifically the black church, uh, AME churches, um, Zion. Uh, I played for a Zion church in, in Boston in Lynn, Massachusetts specifically. And, uh, I just learned so much from the musicians there because they, they just had all these gospel, they'd been, you know, grew up around this stuff and they, all the musicians there just taught me and, and just like brought me into the world. And, and it was, you know, that's, that's kind of how like a lot of that community is, is like, they just, if you can, you know, if you have like a good ear, they, they just, they'll teach you all this stuff and they, they just bring you in and accept you. And it's like, it's, I, I, I now have had a, a gig at, uh, in Norwalk, Connecticut, which is like right above the Bronx, like 30 minutes. And I've had that gig for 12 years. Um, ever since I, I moved to the city and it's, it's like kept me afloat because it's their family where we're, we're going to baptize my child at that church in a, in a couple, couple weeks. And I mean, their family. Um, but like, it's also like the AME church is like a really, um, really deep part of America's like fabric. Right. So it's like when the, uh, underground railroad, um, w during the underground railroad, um, in like the eight, uh, late 1700s to like mid 1800s, um, there was, um, the underground church or the, the AME church served as what was called like a safe house for mm. escaped slaves. And, um, it was, it's just like, I, if anyone's listening here, I really recommend to go watch the black church on PBS. Uh, it's a three part mini series. It's incredible. Um, so yeah, I, I would say gospel music is, is a really big part of, um, and there's so much to learn in gospel music that I have, I have to dig in, but like, it's, um, it's an incredible form of American music. That's like the roots of everything, right? It's like even before blues kind of, so it's gospel music is, you know, is the roots and, and I'm all about, you know, studying from the beginning of American music, right? Like you, you can't just jump into jazz Mm -hmm. uh, and study Dave Brubeck, you have to like start with, um, if you're a pianist, you have to start with like Otis Spann or, uh, like Johnny Johnson and go back as far as, as, or, or, um, um, Fats Waller, right. Mm -hmm. If you're studying the organ, um, who I just really got into this year, uh, because of, uh, when I was at SUNY purchase. Um, so it's like, yeah, there's, there's a whole lot to the organ, but, the first Oregon record was, um, gosh, the first Oregon record was a compilation that Bruce Katz gave me mm. of different Oregon players. And the first thing that stuck out was Billy Preston playing um, Drown in My Own Tears by Ray Charles, who yeah. Billy Preston, of course, played in Ray Charles' band as the organist for many years. But the way that uh, Billy Preston is playing that, he's – playing bass lines with his feet and his left hand is comping and his right hand is playing all these incredible lines. And it's amazing. So oh, that's crazy, man. Yeah. I think the first organ record I heard was root down. Um, yeah. Jim Smith. And, and I think one of my bandmates might've turned me onto that. Cause, cause at the time, like when I was getting into that stuff, this is pre going to Berkeley. It's like, I didn't really know anything about West coast boogaloo and like, mm. you know, just like all the, you know, just like Grant Green stuff, like that that album Alive, that was probably my first record I heard, that yeah. Grant Green record that was like guitar, boogaloo. Oh, this is that sound. This is that West Coast funk jazz sure. blues it's like sound. An, it, it's like an entrance into the into like the world of jazz without having to like it, it's a it's like a like nobody gets hurt. Right. That way. Yeah. Yeah. It's a sound like so like what Soul Live did. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it it's funny because I mean I've never I've never really sat at a Hammond organ and like tried to make music with it really. 
because it's so baffling. Can you yeah. like demystify it for us as far as like, you know, so there's the draw bars, obviously. That's a whole nother thing to sure. understand. But there's like sections upon sections of draw bars and like understanding the mechanics of that instrument seems yeah. to me like that's like an undertaking in and of itself. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, just like anything, you have to start simple and start with the roots and um, just just looking at like the history of a quick brief history of the Hammond organ um, in 1935, um, um, a, a man by the name of Lawrence Hammond um, created the Hammond organ to be a um, to be a take home version of a pipe organ. So it all these draw bars rec represent um, the length of pipe, right? So it's like, that's why we have um, all the draw bars are numbered one through eight. And so like, if you put it out like two, that's two feet of pipe, right? And mm -hmm. so all the, all the draw bars are doing are they're replicating the, um, the, the length of pipe. And so the, or they're replicating the stops on the, on the a real um, pipe organ, right? So, um, so just, just to show an example, um, like if I have all the draw bars in, you have no sound, right? Now, um, if I put uh, the first draw bar out, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine draw bars here. So mm -hmm. first draw bar is is an, is a a root note, right? So I'll just play C, right? For example, um, here you go. Right, right, yeah. and then I'll, the second one um, is a fifth, the third root, root, fifth, root, third, fifth, uh, root. So all out together. One, that's just that's just one note, right? And then one chord. <laughs> Right, it's just got yeah. a huge sound. So um, there's like so many different combinations of draw bars, um, and then uh, I'll, I'll go through like some basic combinations of that for you in a second. But give me the before you do that, give me the swishy Al Green organ sound. Like what, yeah, what's so, that? So I, I I was in Memphis. I did a record with uh, the the organ player from that with that whole band uh, on Al Green's record, and they're the Hodges brothers. So the guitarist was Teeny Hodges, who, who passed away um, more recently. Um, there was Charles Hodges, who was the organist, and he was in the session, and I was playing Whirly, and I was just like, you know, he was, he, he was playing, yeah, he was playing me this, uh, he was playing and singing Let's Stay Together. So, okay, so that is actually the, the swishy sound he, he told me the secrets to this. So th this is like a Memphis kind of secret is like, um, they all know this. If you're like a Memphis organist and you, you freaking know this. So <laughs> it's the A flat. So there's presets on the organ, right? And these presets are, were, you know, are created to have like different stops all already preset, right? Mm -hmm. So like the A flat preset is um, the let's stay together sound. <laughs> Right. Yeah. So, it, it, and and the reverb, and uh, my organ has a big reverb knob built in. That was another big part of it. They they all used um, um, uh, sp giant spring re spring reverb boxes, right? So, like this has a big spring reverb built in. So, right. So. Right, but the trick to the let's stay together was he also had another setting at the top where he he pulled out draw bar Charles pulled out draw bars and he had he showed me this setting at the top so so it like it like cuts a little more that he would like go for uh, so but he would stay down here on the A flat preset of the organ so um, let's stay together um, 
is F, right? So. is for like when you want to scream you know? yeah so like so and then he did this thing with his hands where he like swished the keys and so he did it with the top and the bottom register so he went <laughs> like that and uh, yeah. uh like together with the top and the bottom so um like that would lead into like the bridge or like <laughs> And it was like that was like his signature sound. And there's an incredible, incredible record with um, the Hodges brothers backing up um, Otis Clay, and it's Otis Clay live in Europe, or no, so live in Japan. And if you if you haven't heard of Otis Clay, mm -hmm. oh my God, um, go check that out. And the the whole the high rhythm section is the name of that Memphis band that backed up. Um, out, that was Al Green's band, but they were also Ann Peebles band. They were mm -hmm. um, so many other uh, incredible artists that were on high records, right? So they were the high records rhythm section. Incredible, one of the best. So is that the same? Is that the same sound as Love and Happiness too? The same kind of they use that all over. Yeah, that is. Um, that's what I was singing. Love and Happiness, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, oh wait, oh yeah, actually, Love and Happiness. Um, yeah, it's that same sound. So love, love and happiness. Uh, God, what key is that in? It's E dominant to E flat to G minor. No, it's, a, it's an A flat minor. Yeah, A flat. Yeah, A flat. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A flat. Yeah. Oh man, that's that's such a. <sighs> right? That, yeah, man. That's yeah. the top. So he uses that to like scream at the top. So. <laughs> <laughs> right? And you could just do so much with the organ. Um, so there's that. And then, I mean, do you have any other questions? I, I, I was going to show you some of the settings, but if you yeah. have, while we're here, if you have questions. Go ahead. Yeah, well, just I mean, I, I never really understood the preset thing. So it's like yeah. that little section of, of the B3. So every single one of those keys is a preset. So like the keys are inverted in color, where as as like on a normal piano, you'll see black keys being the flat notes and, and white keys being the, you know, the, the non accidental notes. Mm -hmm. But it's it's inverted on the presets. So the there's the black, the it's it, it's inverted. So the accidental notes are um, white, and the uh, regular keys are uh, black. So those are all the presets. And so yeah, so basically they're just all different. Oh. And it's actually a really cool thing. Larry Goldings, who's like one of he was my favorite, one of my favorite keyboardists. He uh. He does a lot of stuff with the presets in, in like when he plays with like Schofield um, in, in their organic trio. He does a lot of like. Uh -huh. and, and I'm just taking my left hand and I'm just playing the. Um, just just clicking the presets and I'm just holding one chord in the right hand. So yeah. yeah, that's the presets. But there's a lot to this instrument. There's also percussion. The percussion is like that Jimmy Smith sound. So mm -hmm. like um, where you have like um, the percussion is uh, the first three draw bars out and then like the so there's there's different manuals, but the first three draw bars out on the top manual of the last preset which is called the b because it's the, the note b so mm -hmm. e preset um, um, 
Um, Right back at the chicken mm. check, and then so if you take that percussion off, it's, it loses its bite, right? Yeah, way still more mellow, great, still a great sound, but it's different. Like, but you put that percussion on, and it's like, and especially, and they did this thing called like chicken picking, which mm -hmm. is like coming from like a guitar kind of down, take it down, take it down, take it down, and yeah. like, um. Like, right, all those lines like like to be like a guitarist uh, is like part of the is part of the sound as well. So oh, man. we got that, and another setting is called um, this is my favorite. This is called squabble, and squabble is the first straw bar. Of, of the nine draw bars, it's the first draw bar and the last four. And then the the, um, the Leslie speaker. And the Leslie speaker came two years after the invention of the Hammond organ where mm -hmm. Don Leslie created the Leslie speaker. And there was a lot of feud uh, between Leslie and, and Hammond. Like that Leslie wanted, as you know, as, as you, you might know that Leslie speakers are this rotating cabinet uh, this cabinet that has a rotating horn in it right mm -hmm. and that rotating horn spins the sound around the room to create what's called the doppler effect right when you hear like a train leaving the station it's as you hear you hear like that's that's a, an example of the doppler effect and yeah. this is the sound being thrown around the room and um it it, it spins it around and, and creates like a stereo effect so um that was created two years in 1937 to uh, after to kind of pair with this, but Hammond didn't want to give his like you know he didn't want to give the nut away, so he, he like held on to it, and they they fought for many many years, and now uh, I I believe it's Hammond is is now owned by Suzuki. So really? Suzuki. Yeah, uh, which is you know also obviously like a like motorcycle company, and then um, so is Yamaha, right? Yeah, Yamaha. I mean, dude, think about all the stuff Honda and Yamaha and Suzuki build. Yeah. Besides yeah. the normal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, so it's got, you got this speaker with a rotating horn in it and it, and it pushes air because you feel the horn spinning. So, um, um, this is the squabble sound that Jimmy McGriff really, uh, made famous. One of my favorite organists. Yeah. So, um, I'll play, um, a little thing. Um, by McGriff, and this is with the Leslie spinning fast. So you can have it spinning on stop, you can have it on slow, which it spins slow, or you can have it on fast, which creates this like whirly sound, whir whirling motion sound. What's the break sound, Eric? So when people talk about break, yeah, break is stop. Okay, so okay. There's like there's like slow. There's stop, slow, and fast. If you want to think of it in that order. It's okay, like cool. Red light. Yellow light, green light. Right. <laughs> yeah. Easy uh, enough. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. 
Especially on the organ because it's like lighter notes than the piano so you can be a lot more percussive and that squabble sound just gives you that <laughs> Dude, your phrasing is so great, and your left hand is so great, man. It's oh, just, human. yeah, dude. I mean, I, I I can listen to people play B three all day. There's something about that instrument that it just like it just is a big warm hug to my heart, man. I don't oh, yeah, know, yeah. You know, yeah. I, when I first heard it, same, likewise, it's it's just it's the combination of that Leslie speaker and the um and the and the and the Hammond itself. The Hammond, the back yeah. of it, it's just like. Uh, uh, Henry Ford uh, bought one of he he um, he invested on the on the uh, the design of, of the Hammond organ. Um, he was one of the first investors, and he he was one of the first purchasers uh, of the of he got like the second Hammond that was per, that was in production. Uh, so he was uh, he he helped fund the production of the Hammond organ. So when you look at the back of the Hammond, you see like it's wires and tubes and things like a, like a, like a car, you know, my yeah. tubes, but yeah, it's, it's crazy, crazy. Just how it looks like is. a chemistry set back there, man. Yeah. It's, it's nutty. <laughs> it's nutty, man. Well, thank you for taking us through a little bit of the history and functionality. Cause it's, it's, it's something that's always really interesting to me because I've never, I had a Nord electro for a long time. I sold it. I'm so I'm kicking myself that I sold my electro too. Yeah. Shouldn't have done that. But there's so many great keyboards now that can emulate it. Dude, I was in the studio last week and I, I wrote a song that's going to be a theme song for a TV show for PBS and, oh, I saw. and for MPT. Very cool. Yeah. And um, I played all the instruments and he pulled up. A, I was like, do you have a nice organ and Luna? And Luna has this killer. I've never heard a VST sound this convincing and this good. I mean, it, it was what like. The, what's the instrument? Or what is it? I can't remember what it was called, but he it was the first one he pulled up. He went through there was like several organ VSTs in there. Oh, like a Hammond organ VST. Yeah. And I had him go back. I was like, go back to the first one. I kept going back to that. And in the mix and everything, I was like, this feels like the most organic B3 sound I've ever heard a doll emulate. Yeah, there's like VB3 is like the best that I've I've heard. VB3 is like really good. Really? Yeah. Who makes, who makes that? Um, I don't know. Is v it Universal v Audio or is it like a different? Uh, VB3, I, dude. I think it might be VB3. It might be its own, like thing. its own plugin. That's cool. I, I have to look it up, but sorry. it's come a long way. But I mean, if you get to the point where you can, like, you can sit down with like a controller and play a piano sound or a Whirly or a Rhodes and or a mm -hmm. B3 and be impressed, mm -hmm. you know that the technology's come a pretty long way. You know. Yeah. Because yeah. even when we were at school, like that technology wasn't there yet, it, not at all. Like it sound choked out. It doesn't. Yeah. It didn't yeah. sound natural. You had to humanize everything, velocity yeah. wise. You know. Yeah, there's a great pedal called um, the a Neo <laughs> Ventilator that that um, does a great job of like uh, physically, like it's a physical um, yeah. stomp box pedal. That's that's the best that I found. Dude, the other one, I'll show you this. Um, the other one that Charlie Hunter told me about years ago is the Strymon Lex. Oh, you know, right. I've heard you know about this thing? Yeah. This thing is, is pretty guitar. dang good. Yeah, but you could, you could use it. I've seen people put it on an electro and use sure. it. You know, 
it's great. It does the break thing. It, it's it's really cool, man. This is like the this is like that Gilmore like Clapton, you know, Leslie sound that yeah. is great for guitar, but it's it's really impressive. So I mean the technology's getting there, man. It's getting there. Yeah. Um, I wanted to before because like I don't wanna you you spend so much time on that. I, I don't wanna like suck up your time by teaching us about the B3, but yeah. Love I wanted it. to talk to you about playing with Kraz and uh-huh. getting on the road. Like, so jo- we have a mutual friend, Jordan Rose, who's a killing drummer who, yes. if nobody has gone to see you know, Theo Katzman in the last couple years, you should go see him as soon as he starts playing again, just to watch Jordan play the drums. <laughs> I mean, he's, sure. his sound, like I tell him this all the time, that dude tunes a drum set better than anybody I've ever heard. His sound is one of the best drum sounds in the in the industry right now as far as yeah. i'm concerned yeah I mean, it just is um, yeah yeah he 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 really comes uh, he and i came we we're roommates when he first moved to the city and we toured with an artist named joe lewis walker mm-hmm. who is an incredible blues guitarist and singer and he was you know he's like a musical dad to both of us and he he really really kind of got us in you know got us situated with where we needed to be with our playing yelled at us if we were stomping on his vocals, you know, uh, you know, comping or playing over his vocals, playing, if Jordan was playing too loud, if I was comping too much, all that stuff. So, you know, what you need. And Joe's still out and doing his thing. Um, Joe Lewis Walker. But uh, yeah, Jordan and I, we came into the city at the same time and we started checking out, um, we started going to like 55 bar in New York City and this little dive bar and we would go and see Tony Mason, the incredible drummer, um, play with like Andy Hess on bass. And, you know, these are the guys that have played on like Schofield's like Uber Jam records and stuff. Um, and we were just like, that's where, that's what we want to do. And, and of course the great keyboard players like Brian Charette and people like that would be playing with them. Um, and, uh, yeah. So, Tony had this huge sound, but wasn't loud, you know, like didn't hit. It was a big sound that like took up the space of the whole room. And the way he plays still is like that. But like t- Tony's sound is like, inc- it just like was so warm and took up so much space, but it never was piercing. Right. And it was just so much control with his hands. And Jordan kind of like got into that camp and, and has really, you know, taken off on his own. Oh, but yeah. you know, Jordan was kind of one of like the Tony Mason puppies when he came to the city. Oh man. He, I mean, he's going to, that dude's going to be working all the time. Nine you know, five. Like, I mean, he never, he never has to worry about it getting a gig. I yeah. mean, both of you guys, cause like everybody's always looking for a great keyboard player and a great drummer. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like my, my keyboard player loves your playing. Like oh, man. when I told him, that you were going to be on and stuff. He's like, no way. Blah, blah, blah. He just absolutely loves. No, 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 no. No, <laughs> no, he really does. He's, and he's a student of music, man. He like huge John. He turned me on to John Cleary and oh, yeah. a bunch of great stuff, you know? Hell yeah. But, um, here's a man. Yeah. Well, so tell me a little bit. So how did, how did the, um, the Krasno thing happen? Like, so how did you, get into that band and like it, that clip you posted today was fire, bro. Thanks. That, Thank that solo was great. Thank you, man. Yeah, um, man. Well, let's see. Uh, I, of course at Berkeley, you, you know, you, you hear the name Krasno and, and you can't not know that name when you go to Berkeley. Uh, and so I, I, I was just, you know, I learning organ for the first time I had to get into soul live and it was like, Oh my God, the left hand, the drums, the guitar, it's all so killing. And then, um, you know, as, you know, studied that and studied that and tried to, you know, do my best, uh, you know, um, my, my, my best left hand impersonation of what he was doing, but Jesus, he, I mean, um, anyways, um, yeah, ne- I, Neil, I, Neil doesn't mess around. I so feel like Neil's Neil's Neil, left hand is. <laughs> no, oh, he's, he's the best. He's the best. So, but uh, yeah, so I I was everyone tries tries to be Neil, of course. And so, um, when I gra- after I graduated, a couple years after, I I heard Kraz was like, um, like, getting, you know, 
he was getting this drummer that I knew on his gig named Eric Kalb, and I was playing with Eric Kalb a bunch, and um, still am playing with Eric Kalb, who's also on the Uber Jam Records, uh, Schofield's Uber Jam Records. And Eric is one of my favorite drummers, and so playing with Eric Kalb, we ended up doing this like um, I was playing with a, a guitarist named Scott Sherrard, and Scott was um, Greg Allman's music director, and. Scott is is one of the best guitarists in the city, and so Scott uh, asked Kraz to be on a gig, and I I knew that that was kind of like my moment to like not show off, but like show out a little bit, you know, like without like showing off without like being an an asshole, you know. Uh, excuse my French, but like <laughs> but showing off without I being a mean. jerk about it, right? So I I just wanted to I knew he was going to be on the gig, and I wanted to make an impression. Um, because frankly, I wanted to be in his band, so I uh, I I did a lot of research on his songs, and I learned all the harmonies. And when we got to uh, um, rehearsal for the, we did a big gig at um, um, a, one of the big big stages in, in New York. I, I forget it was a uh, Terminal Five, and we we, uh, we did the gig, and it was like really it was a big Almond Brothers tribute thing. That Scott was leading, and I and but then we did some of Kraz's songs, and I learned his vocals, and he was like, "Whoa, bro, you learned my vocals, sick!" And I was like, "Thanks, bro." And then uh, and then I you know got his number, and then I emailed him, and uh, he you know got back. He's like, "So much fun, man!" And I was like, "Oh, dang it!" You know, like that like blanket email of you know response, like, "Oh, great, so much fun!" And then like right. I you know to but that was that was the kind of the ticket in. I was like, I, I got his information, and anyone watching that's like younger, you get their information. You you know you make sure it's being in the right place at the right time, being prepared, right? So I felt like I was prepared. I did my job. I contacted him after, and you know he was like, cool man, love the you know, so much fun. And then like uh, two weeks later, he was like, yo, can you do this gig with me? And I was like, oh uh, yeah. And so I was you know throughout all the other like gigs I was doing. And I, I did like a little um, one off with him and with his band in like upstate New York. And then, um, you know, we, we all got along really well. And, you know, a lot of it is like a lot of people can play. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of it is about the hang. And so like um, Eric Krasno is like one of the best leaders I've ever been around and, and I've toured with him a lot. And so, uh, just, just to skip forward, we we started eventually playing uh, organ trio because like he hadn't done an organ trio really since Soul Live. So we started uh, Eric Kalb, myself, and and Eric Krasno were all Eric's, and we started an organ trio called E3, and we put out a record uh, over during COVID, um, and you know, uh, it's a live record, and um, it just kind of captured the the live sound in the room, but. Yeah, it was just I was just persistent with with Krasno and made sure that I like um, always came prepared because someone like him always gets you know big gigs uh, mm -hmm. you know and so I you have to be prepared when you're around someone like that you can't you can't really like uh, you know if if you want, in. yeah if you want if you want to do the next thing up and he he is like the next thing up and he he's kind of like at the ceiling of a lot of stuff so it's like you have to be prepared when you when you encounter someone like that. Yeah, I the moral of the story. Is there anything? So when when Danny was on my show, we talked a little about about like what he took away from Kraz. Like you saying, like he's a great leader, band leader. Yeah. Is there anything like any musician life lessons that you learned from him? Because because Danny had a bunch to say as yeah. well. But is there anything yeah. that you feel like was a was a big moment where you're like, oh wow, like that is going to change the way that I approach this, you know? Yeah, of course. Um, maybe like starting with off the stage, the first, um, the first thing I, I saw was when we'd be traveling and like some, something crappy would happen. Um, uh, you know, if we were like driving somewhere and like if the van broke down, he never got like, um, upset really he just he would be like oh oh all right well you could you never really saw i've never seen him like 
like visually like upset he he kind of just like made sure like everybody was like you know because if you see the leader upset then it really is like a downer on you know it's a chain reaction so he really had this way of just like being calm under pressure so that like transferred to the stage so like when we like sound check he would just be so that would just like kind of his demeanor just like transfers to everybody else and when you're on stage um you just kind of feel really comfortable and he makes you feel really real relaxed and that's a big part of, of playing because like if you're tense and like the leader is like a, a jerk then you know ever you feel that in the music but the way he is he's just like he kind of lets you do your thing we had our songs we had our you know stevie wonder cover big brother uh you know we would go different places every night with it and he'd just be cool with it and it's just like that was just kind of the biggest thing i took away was how relaxed he made everybody and then there's of course how great he is as a rhythm guitar player mm -hmm. first off like when he would accompany he and the drummer he and eric Cow, he just gets inside of of the beat so so deep and he becomes a second drummer you know a la james brown right like the way james brown looked at every instrument as a drum so Kraz is definitely like coming from that world and I picked up like rhythm is such a huge thing. And then of course his soloing is great, incredible. Um, and so we would just, we just had good chemistry, all of us. And, and we would all hang out and, and, you know, drink a little bit after the show and hang out and, and, you know, the hang is a big part of the show or mm -hmm. a big part of the whole gig. So it's like, you can't, you can't just do the gig and then, I gotta go guys like, yeah. <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta hang out and we hung out and it's always been a great hang and it's you know I look forward to getting back with those yeah. dudes yeah. it seems like did you when you when you get a chance to blow and he's like go for it is there like there's no time limit there's no bar limit so let's just see where it goes kind of thing like he's yes but, yes, but I'm also like yeah you, you have to like from playing with Joe Lewis Walker I learned that there's always a limit to blowing and <laughs> and like especially when there's like special guests like like if like Corey Wong or like Isaiah Sharkey was there like you kind of have to kind of like let them have it you mm -hmm. know like you know you only actually really have a, a certain amount of bars to to blow because it's it's not about you it's about like accompanying those people that are the special guests so mm -hmm. i would say that's the answer to that question okay yeah it's but, interesting but when it's just a trio yeah, we, we could stretch out more, but but then again, you know, I I I I don't want to go. I don't ever want to solo too long. I, I I there's always a limit, and, and you kind of can can tell just by doing it over and over again, right? Just like mm -hmm. you and your band, like you know, you're not you're gonna lose the crowd if if you start rambling. Like if I start talking and talking and talking without a pause or anything in the set end, it's gonna lose a lot of people. So you want to pause. You want to breathe. Let other people take it and you know be it's my 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 whole concept is is like i read this thing off of like a Derek trucks uh poster in a in a venue once where it was like a quote from Derek trucks and one of the things it was like the com 10 commandments i don't know if you've seen that of Derek. Mm, trucks. no and it's so great because it's just like he just talks about supporting and making us make when you're not soloing like lifting the band and then he talks about the, the stage being a temple and and treating it like it's the most holy place that, you know, even if you don't believe in this or that, it's like that is your temple. When you're mm -hmm. on stage, you treat it like such and, you know, like it's just the most like you're there and, and you lift everybody. You have to lift every, everybody up. Mm -hmm. um, so beautiful. and then when you're soloing it, his his idea and I think about this all the time. And I used to listen to Kofi Burbridge uh, play before I would do any gig because it would get me in that headspace because Kofi's playing was so perfect with like comping and then like the most tasty playing because he would accompany and then when he would solo, it was the, what was coming from Derek Trucks. They kind of had that same mentality of like what Derek said in that ten, those Ten Commandments were one of those things about soloing where make it sound like you're singing, right? And you know that since he has the slide uh, bottleneck action happening like he's already got that going but like why not transfer that to the piano right why not make everything sing like the way Chuck Lavelle sang on Jessica so mm -hmm. it's like um, yeah that's so great man 
it, it's it's something that we can all kind of take away from and that's a very mature musical like approach you know it's like in, when we're younger we're all like blah, 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 spazzing out playing yeah. music but like these days more and more and more it, it's like important for us to all remember that when we get on stage that like it's a team mm -hmm. I, I saw the funniest thing and then and then i want to say one more thing before we get into the lightning round but i saw the funniest gig one time i was at a mo show yeah and uh something went wrong i don't know what went wrong within an improvisation it, it was a, there was a train wreck that happened yeah and you know those guys are all kind of giving each other crap afterwards and on the mics in front of us like kind of like banter uh -huh. and I, I think uh <laughs> well i think i don't know if it was al somebody said dude there's no i in team and the other and i think chuck was like but there is a you and suck <laughs> you know, like, dude I, you know they're all just razzing each other these guys yeah. have been playing together forever but no. I, thought, I think about that a lot too because i'm like when when you do get on a stage it's like we're, we've all got each other's back we have to have each other's back yeah so if you start to feel that there's something that's like starting to lose interest or you know something's not developing the way it is like it's our job is like supporting whoever the soul is to like bring it back yeah and support them and be like dude we got you we got you come on yeah. like you know what i mean yeah. like it doesn't happen all the time you know in music but it happens like yeah. even for the professionals man you know mm -hmm. so but i think it's a healthy thing to think about i gotta find that that list of that Derek trucks tank command yeah it's like never seen commandments that. yeah I'll, I'll look for it and send it to you but it's yeah yeah it's, i've thought about that so many times and, and jordan and i would always kind of like read that when before we'd go on the stage on stage and and there's like this weird uh, energy thing that we did um, with um, the bass player was Lenny Bradford, and he's an incredible bass player out of Boston. And he would he was he's he's uh, Native American and African American, and he's he'd always do this energy thing with his hands before every gig. I it's not actually weird. It was amazing, and he would he would like hand us the ball of energy mm -hmm. and like have me pass it to Jordan, and then like. Then you like put it, you know, you like put put the energy on yourself, and then you go out and play, and it was yeah. really awesome because like it just kind of took away that whole like notion of like we have to, you know, uh, of worrying, you know, that that whole energy like kind of took that worry away, and we were able to go out and and just kind of like be all connected. I guess that that was the point of it. It was like connecting us, even if you don't believe in that stuff. Like it yeah. worked, you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. it worked because we were all like standing it's like it's like that trick where um you're in a room with 10 people and um you have a person in a chair you know and then every the 10 people it's like a large person right or if it's like uh three people around the chair and there's like the biggest person in the room sits in the chair and you all try to lift that person up but you can't and then you stack your hands on each other and then you go one, two, three, and you lift the chair up, and it's like, have you, have you ever done that? <laughs> no. Oh, yeah. It's it's crazy. So I mean, I believe it, man. I mean, it's just every time I've done that, at like, in any time, any situation, it's like, it's just, it happens, and it works. So mm. it's like the same idea about going on stage and, like, having some kind of, like, mantra before you go on with, with each other, you know? Yeah, man. Oh, that's great. Well, before we do the lightning round, get down, yeah. goofy questions – um, you just have a record that you put out very recently. Yeah. Um, just tell the people where they can find that and everything. Yeah. Um, the record is called, um, Eric, it's the Eric Finland organ quartet. And, um, you can find the, uh, you can find the record at cdbaby.com. You can go to, um, it's on Spotify and all the streaming websites and um it's on Bandcamp too right like on Bandcamp and so i i have a vinyl that uh i released with it and the vinyl is coming and i got the test presses and it's amazing it's mm -hmm. it, they did a great job at the test presses um but yeah it was with eric kalb uh will bernard on guitar incredible he, mm -hmm. and he's played with everybody uh and moses patru on percussion so um it's the eric finland organ quartet and uh the title is the trick bag okay so yeah it's really good thank you guys <laughs> should get it i should get a copy of that vinyl it sounds great it reminded me of when i first heard it it reminded me of that stanton moore record um 
that was like a like an organ trio record. It was like emphasis on the parenthesis. That's cool. And, yeah, yeah. So Will was on that record. Will, yeah, I Will know was the guitarist on that record. So it's like that was that was my dream team of of people to to record when I was at Berkeley. Like I was listening to Kraz. I was listening to Will Bernard. Like those were my two guys on guitar that I was like really digging. And I've been fortunate enough to be able to play with them. So yeah. uh, you know, it's just practice and being in the right place at the right time and, and being prepared in the right place at the right time not right. just being in the right place but being yeah. prepared right i wish we would have met earlier when we were there together man could have made some cool music yeah no, I, <laughs> I, I distinctly remember you from uh um from uh the the stage performance class yeah it was, with that was a, taylor where he had the same rap every single class right yeah it was so amazing yeah it was mind-blowing some of the stuff he said is just it's so like simple and stupid but it's so true and so you true. don't you he's, know yeah i mean very effective he's a master man. very effective teacher um, yeah even if you're getting the exact same lesson in, in the other class but hey what works you know if yeah. it works, don't 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 break don't fit don't mess with it yeah <laughs> all right eric you ready to do some lightning round get down yes sir all right so you know the drill here 10 silly questions. You can just explain your answers if you'd like. You can just burn through these. Whatever you'd like to do. Um, first one's always the same. Lennon or McCartney? Um, Lennon. Okay. Nachos or wings? Um, I, I mean, nachos, I guess. But if the wings are... Um... If they're if they're over, you know, if they're crispy, I'll take the wings. Oof. You like hot sauce? Uh I like sriracha. Me yeah, too. yeah, hot sauce is great. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm not like a buffalo wings guy. I, I don't like sauce. Dry rub all day. Oh, okay. Okay. Dry rub. All right. Um swimming or skiing? Um whoa, bro. Whoa. Uh skiing. Okay. Roller coaster or bumper cars? Um, bumper cars. Alaska or Hawaii? Um, I've been to neither. So, <laughs> what would you look out of the two? If someone was like, "Here's a ticket, you can go to either of these places." Yeah, exactly. Um, Hawaii for sure. Okay. Booker T, or Jimmy Smith. Ooh, nice. You came prepared. Um, man, you, you can't really, uh, you, you, there's no, there's no comparison. Uh, I, I can't, I can't, it's a great, it's a great, uh, attempt to ask a question, but I'm, <laughs> what if, uh, so you'll choose death on that one. I yeah. gotta choose. Death. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. So if you had to choose one of these guys has to be your dad, <laughs> Michael Scott or Dwight Schrute. <laughs> Michael Scott. Okay. <laughs> uh. All right. For a superpower, would you rather have telepathy or teleportation? Uh, well, as a musician, telepathy, right? That's that's what we work on every day. That's true. Very yep. true. All right. Whirly or Rhodes? Uh, Whirly. Big time. Big time. <laughs> I mean, from the first time I heard, you know, uh, what I, or what's the, oh my gosh, where it's at. The first time I heard that Beck tune, I was like, what oh. is that instrument? What is oh. that? <laughs> oh yeah. It's so raw and it's got the, it's got that vibrato on it. You know, yeah. it's, it's, it just, it's, it's a little more, it just kind of cut to the soul. Yeah. I like whirlies too, man. Yeah. All right. Last question. Sure. Sometimes this is like ridiculously easy. Sometimes it's, you know, super hard. If you could take one record and erase it from your memory so you could listen to it for the first time again and experience it for the first time again, what record would that be? Oh, man. Uh, uh, continuum. Okay. Okay. So why Continuum? It was so good. It was so good. Yeah, it's really good. <laughs> yeah. I mean... I don't want to say that's his swan song, but man, it's hard to touch that one. Oh yeah, no, I mean it's just 
I just had it. On, it, was, it was so good. And yeah. it just kind of hit me in a point in life where, like, it's not my favorite record of all time, but it's just it's just that point in life where I, when I heard it, it like really hit me hard, and and I just, you know, it if it was at that point in life and you erased it and I heard it again, you know, that's kind of it. It all goes into that. You think it would happen again? You think you'd have that same reaction at this age? Um, yeah, I, I think so. So no. is that the question at this age? No, no. Well, I'm just like, you know, if you could listen to anything. No, I wouldn't have the same reaction at this age. But I would uh, I would be uh, – if it was when I heard it back then and if you erased it, I, I think, like, it just had that effect on me that, like, you know, it was just – it was so – it was so great, you know, at mm-hmm. the time in my life. But yeah, it's different now. Um, but it's still incredible. And Larry yeah. Goldings is playing organ on that. It's amazing. Do you love the scary Golding stuff? Yeah, it's really good. Oh man. <laughs> really Some good. of that stuff with Robin Ford on it. Ooh. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man. well, all the Robin Ford stuff with Larry Goldings on it, right? It's like true. Yeah. Oh man, that music. Yeah. All right. Well, Eric, dude, thank you Mark, so much, man. Dude. Very proud of you doing this, doing this whole YouTube cast thing that you're doing. It's thanks, man. Great. Yeah, Th- thanks. Well, and it's, it's I feel the same way about you and like all my buddies who are out there doing it with my heroes too. Like when I see that stuff, it really warms my heart. I'm just like, yeah. man, because there's there's people that I went to school with that I'm just like wish nothing but the best for. And like you're one of those cats. When I saw you were playing with them, I was like, heck yeah, yeah. Like. Cause it's just like, it makes sense. Like you're, that music is in you and that's like, you have big ears. Like yeah. you can, Freaking you can blow with the, with the best of them, man. So it's just like, I, I can't, I hope, I hope you guys get back to it and you come through here. I would love to come see you play with them. I, cause I haven't seen you play with him. Other than clips. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Cool. I mean, I, I live in, uh, my, I live, my parents live in DC, so I, I'm always passing through. Um, so, you know, nice. Uh, we'll have to get together at some yeah, point, man. Of course. Yeah. Cool. Well, Great. ladies and gentlemen, thanks for hanging out. Um, next week, oh man, next week I'm going to be super nerdy because Eli Lester from Two Rock Amps, the CEO, head of Two Rock Amps, is going to be on here. And that's my favorite amplifier company. Um, so you guys should step by for that. It's going to be Tuesday. We've been we've been pivoting, Eric, the past couple of weeks, working around schedules and yeah, m- moving things around. But um, so I appreciate you doing that tonight. And because my daughter's birthday was last night. So, oh, great. Yeah. So, but ladies and gentlemen, take care of yourself, take care of each other. Yeah. And we will see you next time. All right, Mark. Thank you, buddy. Yeah, man.